Welcome to the Queen of Hearts podcast. And here's the queen herself, registered dietitian Heather Klug. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Queen of Hearts podcast. I'm Heather Klug, registered dietitian at the Karen Yon Center. Yay! And with me today is my co host, Bethany DeBrew Adams. Hello, Bethany. Hello, Heather. It's so nice to be sitting across from you for one of these again after so many months of I know. being far, far away. We are in Bethany's very well decorated, festive dining room right now. Yay! She's thank making you. my house look, you know. I don't, not so good right now because I haven't even started decorating. <laughs> we can pretend. We can pretend you have. I haven't seen it. So, well, Bethany, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Yes, it is. The holiday season is upon us. And even though we may have some mixed feelings about the holidays <laughs> this year, celebrating however we end up doing it has some real tangible health benefits. Right, Bethany? Yeah, it does, actually. Um, we've heard a lot of talk this year. I think kind of back in November, how decorating for the holidays even earlier than normal um, was a good thing because it can give us a mood boost, which is true. Now, this uh, I don't think this necessarily pertains to if you put your tree up in July because there are people who do that, <laughs> but I'm not one of those people. Did you know, though, that holiday shopping can lower your blood pressure? I did not. It's true. Well, mine's really low right now then. <laughs> <laughs> a 2016 study in health psychology found that the more money people spent on others, the lower their blood pressure was two years later. And I really? think, yeah, and I huh. think it instead of saying the more people spent on others, I think as opposed to yourself, not yeah. like spending thousands of dollars on somebody else. Eating together, for example, has been shown to help curb obesity. And since we eat a lot of family meals during the holiday season, even if it's just our immediate family, we reap those benefits then. And sharing a laugh over the holidays, whether by watching a funny holiday movie or sharing memories on a Zoom call or having fun playing a game, reduces stress on both your mind and your heart. So there's lots of bonuses for our health, regardless of which holidays we choose to celebrate. That is really fascinating. Yeah. But I have to say that being a dietitian, <laughs> I know that the holidays also tend to bring some temptations that aren't quite so healthy. Whatever could you mean, Heather? <laughs> and you know I'm going to mention the food. The trick is, how do we enjoy the traditional foods we love to eat each December without compromising all the good the holidays do for our hearts? Well, yeah, and exa that's exactly what I wanted to ask you today. So we talk so much about Christmas, and we know about many of the traditional foods for that. Cookies, um, the holiday ham, all of those boozy holiday drinks. We tend to know what we can do to keep those more heart healthy. Right, like portion control, substituting leaner cuts of meat, mm -hmm. using like diet soda or other low calorie drinks, you know, for the mixed drinks. Right. right. But today I wanted to talk more about some of the other holidays that we celebrate in December. Celebrations like Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and even Boxing Day because we have listeners tuning in not only here in the United States but also around the world, which is really cool. We love that. Yeah. And we know everybody has their own traditions. Well, I'm really excited to learn more about these holidays. There are some in there I didn't recognize. <laughs> okay, well, good. Let's start by one that you probably do do recognize, and mm -hmm. that's Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is the Jewish festival of lights. This year it began the evening of Thursday, December 10th, and it lasts eight days. So this year it will be going to the evening of Friday, December 18th. I do know some things about Hanukkah. I know that candles are important, mm -hmm. and they are placed in a menorah and lit each night of the Hanukkah celebration. Yep. And I know about the dreidel game, where you spin the dreidel and you sometimes win small treats and things. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I learned the rules of that while I was researching Hanukkah. I won't go into it here, but you're it, gonna play it. <laughs> I if I had a dreidel, I would because you do get like you mentioned small treats. Ooh. Yeah. 
So, but it's good that you mentioned the candles because they are very important to the Hanukkah celebration. And for the same reason that some of the traditional Hanukkah foods are, they symbolize the small amount of oil that miraculously burned for eight days instead of one. And two of the most popular traditional Hanukkah foods are latkes, which are potato pancakes that are made with shredded potatoes and then pan fried in oil. Which are delicious. Yes, they are very good. <laughs> mm. And also a treat, and I hope I don't butcher this, known as sufganyat. I heard it as sufganyat. Okay. These are deep fried jelly filled donuts. I can say donut. So <laughs> I know I got that right. Um, that are usually rolled in sugar. So, Heather, I know that we're usually supposed to stay away from fried foods, but these are eaten specifically for a traditional reason. So is there any way they can be included in a Hanukkah celebration, but like in a more heart-healthy way? Since they are so important to the celebration itself, we wouldn't want to exclude either of these dishes. Right. But there's no rule against tweaking the recipes a little bit. (laughs) I like hearing that. Yeah. For example, I would suggest using sweet potatoes or zucchini to make the pancakes. Okay. And instead of frying, you could bake them and then you could drizzle a little extra virgin olive oil on the top. Okay. For the sofganiat, I would suggest using a whole wheat flour to make the donut dough. Okay. You could also bake these or even pop them in the air fryer if you have have one. Ah, yet another way to use an air fryer. Yes. So those are great ideas. Good ways to make sure you incorporate tradition while staying, you know, somewhat healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's also common to serve a lot of different side dishes as part of a Hanukkah celebration as well. Yes. Even though delicious things like kugel and challah are served a lot. And I love challah. (laughs) Sides like a variety of vegetables and even big salads are served as well. So there's lots of opportunities to include all of that good heart healthy fiber. All right. (laughs) Well, let's move on to another holiday that's chock full of tasty food. And that's the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which happens on December 12th. I don't think I'm familiar with that one, Bethany. Yeah, I wasn't either. It's traditionally a Mexican Catholic celebration that commemorates the appearance of the Virgin Mary to the Mexican peasant Juan Diego back in 1531. Huh. Yeah, and it's celebrated by typically having a big procession to celebrate Mary, and then that's usually followed by a mass and then a fiesta. Okay. So in Mexico, there are pilgrims who descend upon Mexico City to the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe year-round. It's this big, big church. Okay. And there are thousands of people that come on this particular day. So they'll have hundreds of people that come any other day, but thousands from around the world come on the feast day. And I've seen pictures. It looks like quite an incredible Hmm. event. Oh, it sounds like it. (laughs) You mentioned a fiesta afterwards. Mm -hmm. Usually a fiesta means there will be some tasty food. Oh, you think, (laughs) right? So first, I should mention that there is dancing. It's typically... Yay! yay, I knew you'd like that. (laughs) It's typically an Aztec style of dance, which is performed by conchero dancers. Okay. And believers also sing. They have some traditional hymns that they sing as well as part of this. And then comes the food. Okay. So before the mass, you usually have a traditional kind of like breakfast type deal with Mexican baked goods and Mexican hot chocolate. And I don't know if anybody out there has had real Mexican hot chocolate. I have not. (laughs) It's so good. I remember having it in Mexico the first time. There's um, some spices like cinnamon and chili powder in there. And it's just, it just Mm. takes it up a notch. Yeah. But then when you move into the fiesta in the afternoon after the mass, you have things like tamales, chicken mole, tortas, tacos, gorditas, carnitas, atole, which is a hot corn and masa-based beverage, and pozole, which is a traditional soup made with hominy and meat, and then a variety of vegetables and spices. I think it's very like specific to your family yeah. how you make the recipe. Okay, that all sounds so <laughs> delicious. It's a good thing there's some dancing involved. You can burn (laughs) off some of that food. Right? Yeah. So when we think about maybe how to make something like this a little bit healthier, a lot of the stuff I was hearing, there's quite a bit of 
either starchy things or sugary things. So right. we're talking a lot of carbs. Yeah. And so one of my big tips, I guess, when there's a lot of stuff high in carbs is to really just kind of keep portions in check. So for anything starchy, really try to keep the amount to maybe like a fist size. Okay. Okay. Because that's usually like a cup kind of okay. right around there. Desserts, obviously, don't just don't eat too many of those. <laughs> but as far as other things, like I think traditionally most Mexicans use corn tortillas and things, whereas here we might use flour tortillas. Right. So always try to stick to corn. They're usually smaller in size, okay. which is helpful. That's true. And then there's usually fiber in there. So that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're making like a rice and beans dish, you could choose brown rice, right, to get a little bit more fiber. Um, you could switch to oil for cooking since often a lot of lard right, oh, okay. tend to traditionally be used. So just sure. switching to any kind of oil would be good there. Certainly limiting the amount of cheese. because I know. Again, <laughs> I love cheese too, but just small amounts. And then for things like your different meats, pick leaner meats, first of all, like right. we talked about earlier, and then prepare them healthfully. So bake, broil, you know, grill. grill, you could pan fry and just a small amount of oil too if you want to go that route. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears and move to this next holiday, which can be thought of kind of like the one that started it all for those of us who celebrate Christmas. Okay. That is Yule, which is the celebration of the winter solstice. This is the shortest day of the year, and it heralds the daylight hours growing longer again, which those of us who live up here in the north (laughs) I <laughs> really thrilled about because it's now like four o'clock and it's getting dark yeah. and it's depressing. Yeah. Um, for pagans, it's also a day when light and dark are in perfect balance, according to them. Hmm. I don't think many people realize that Yule, which is on December 21st, is the basis for a lot of our holiday traditions because you just don't hear about it that much. So can you think of any holiday traditions that might be associated with Yule? Pop quiz, Heather. Mm. <laughs> well, I know of one for sure. That's the Yule log. Yeah, that's right. Um, ding, ding, ding. Yay! You, <laughs> you win a prize? Um, <laughs> ancient Scandinavians burned a huge ash log to honor the god Thor. And then in Celtic tradition, a communal hearth fire was kept to prevent unwelcome spirits from entering the home. Hmm. And now there's a log-shaped cake to celebrate as well. There is, and they're delicious. <laughs> and let's not forget the Yule Log channel that we can find on TV mm-hmm. at this time of year if you don't have a fireplace in your house. Another tradition we get from Yule is decking our halls with evergreens. Mm. Um, evergreens symbolize life, rebirth, and renewal. They were thought to have power over death and to encourage the sun to return, which Yay. we all are in favor of. Yay! And a few of the food traditions we get from Yule are some of our favorite kind of Christmassy things that we think about, like gingerbread. Oh, now we're talking. Mm-hmm. Mm. Eggnog. Mm. And the traditional wassail, as Ooh. in here we come a wassail. Yeah, I like a good wassail. <laughs> well, I can tell you there are many healthier eggnog recipes out there. Yes. I have one that I make that I will include with our show notes. Yes, and I've had that one, I believe. Mm-hmm. And because wassail is usually made with wine, ale, or apple cider, and a combo of all different spices, I would argue for moderation, like we've <laughs> mentioned before, for cocktails. Again. <laughs> yeah, the same with gingerbread. It's a treat, so it should be eaten like a special treat. Right. That means a little bit. And if it's well-made gingerbread that's full of spices, you probably don't need much to enjoy all the flavors. Right, so. like really good gingerbread yeah. is going to have that punch mm, of ginger. That's right. So I have to admit our next holiday is one that I was really interested in because I've been hearing about it for for a long time, but I was really unfamiliar with the traditions of it. And that's Kwanzaa. Yeah, this is one that I know a little bit about, but I'm not fully familiar with it. So do you want to share that with our listeners? I would love to. So I was actually surprised. The first thing that surprised me was that Kwanzaa was first celebrated only in 1966. So Mm -hmm. it's not much older than we are, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, saying something these days. (laughs) We're always happy to hear that. Maulana Karenga, 
a black nationalist who later became a college professor, created Kwanzaa as a way of uniting and empowering the African-American community in the aftermath of the deadly Watts riots in the 1960s. Mm. So he chose the name Kwanzaa from the Swahili phrase Matunda ya Kwanzaa, which means first fruits, because the holiday was modeled on traditional African harvest festivals. So the important thing to remember with Kwanzaa is that it's not a religious holiday. It's Mm -hmm. a cultural one. So Africans of all faiths can celebrate it. And there are seven principles of Kwanzaa. And they're unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, Purpose, creativity, and faith. Hmm. I like those seven principles. Yeah. It's, yeah. It sounds very well balanced, yes. which is nice. Now, I've seen candles used for Kwanzaa, which makes me think of Hanukkah. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing Kwanzaa is also a multi-day celebration. Yeah, it is. As far as the candles, there are three red, which represent the struggle. There are three green, which represent the land. And there's one black, which represents people of African descent. So each night of the six nights of Kwanzaa, the black candle is lit first, and then it alternates between the red candle and the green candle. And each night focuses on one of those seven principles of Kwanzaa. All right, so like most of these December holidays, this one includes food too, right? (laughs) Of course. What is a holiday without food, especially one that's based on a harvest festival, right? Yes. So on the sixth night of Kwanzaa, the Karama feast is held. Participants decorate the table with ears of corn, and there's one that's set out for each child in the family. Okay. And they also decorate with seasonal fruits and vegetables because, I mean, it's a harvest festival, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And then they drink from the unity cup to honor their ancestors. So the food that's actually served at the feast can be whatever you want it to be, but many people choose either food from African culture or African-American cuisine. And a lot of the African-American cuisine we think of is a lot of stuff you tend to find in in Southern cooking, like shrimp and grits and those kinds of things, which are all so good. Oh, yeah. There's sweet (laughs) potato biscuits, cornbread, collard greens, right, with the ham in it, beans and rice, African Creole. You might see Cajun catfish, jerk chicken. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the grits, like shrimp and grits or something along those lines. So with a lot of these dishes, you're usually talking like a lot of fat involved and sometimes a lot of carbs, like Mm -hmm. we talked about earlier, and also sometimes quite a bit of sodium. So quite a few things you can do here. So I was thinking, you know, instead of sweet potato biscuits, you could do like mashed sweet potatoes instead. Mm -hmm. For the collard greens, the big thing there, because that's a mostly healthy dish, but if there's a lot of ham in it, it could just be really high in sodium. So maybe just using less of that ham would be helpful. Again, if you're making beans and rice, you can use brown rice. You could substitute a little bit of the cauliflower rice. If there's, you know, any fish that's being prepared, it could be grilled or broiled, baked. And then for like a shrimp and grits kind of dish, kind of similar to the beans and rice dish, I've seen some where, you know, they've used half grits and then the other half is cauliflower rice. Oh, okay. And then for the sauce, they roast a lot of vegetables and Mm -hmm. puree that. So Okay. And then that adds a whole lot of flavor. You season that and drizzle that on top. Yeah. Ooh, that Mm. sounds good. Yeah. We make shrimp and grits in this house and we do a lot of shaved Brussels sprouts in there. Oh, yeah interesting yeah it's okay. really good i can't tell you how much cheese goes in the grits though i'm oh, not gonna i'm not yeah. gonna spill might want to watch the cheese then too <laughs> okay so this next holiday is one that i've seen on calendars over the years and often wondered what it was because it has such a kind of innocuous name but it's very like what does this mean and that's Boxing Day. Oh, yeah. I've seen that on the day after Christmas on pretty much every calendar I've ever had. Right. I haven't looked it up, though, to see what it is. <laughs> so, so what is it, Bethany? Well, it's mainly celebrated in countries that are connected to the United Kingdom and also some European countries like Germany. And like you said, it's celebrated the day after Christmas, and it's also St. Stephen's Day. Wait, do you mean like in that carol about good King Wenceslas? Yes, good King Wenceslas looked out on the Feast of Stephen, right? Yeah. So believe it or not, this little f- fun fact out there about St. Stephen, apparently there were two of them. Huh. But 
They were both associated with charity and giving, and that's what this holiday is all about. So starting in the Middle Ages, it was the day when the alms boxes were traditionally opened so that the contents could be distributed to the poor. So if you've never heard of alms before, it's like you'd go to church and it's kind of like an offering. You'd put your money into the alms box. Okay. It was also the day when wealthy landowners would give gifts to those who worked and lived on their land. And then later it became traditional that servants got the day off to celebrate Christmas with their families. That's straight out of Downton Abbey, Bethany. I'm trying to remember if we ever saw Boxing Day on Downton Abbey. We probably did, but... Is that how the holiday is still celebrated? I mean, I don't know how many people have servants these days, but (laughs) I'm guessing some of these traditions were altered a bit over the centuries. Yeah, you're right about that. I mean, while Boxing Day still is a day to get out and donate time or money to a good cause and help those who are less fortunate. It's also considered a day to relax and spend some time with family and friends. And it's often celebrated with an open house, which doesn't sound all that relaxing. Mm -hmm. But the way it's done is, since everybody's been working hard to put on a big Christmas feast, Boxing Day is meant to be laid back, so a lot of leftovers are set out. Ah. So, you know, things like cold ham or leftover turkey, salmon, pate, cold cuts, sandwiches, fruits, nuts, baked goods, like things that are already prepared that you don't have to spend a ton of time putzing around with. According to House and Garden magazine in the UK, Boxing Day food is considered quote a way to make leftovers luxurious ah so so clean out your fridge while you entertain (laughs) right that's the more blunt american way of putting it good plan and i love that phrase a way to make leftovers luxurious (laughs) right i'm gonna start calling it that in my house it's a luxurious leftover day (laughs) is that gonna be the way to coax your kids into eating them right yes (laughs) Because like all kids, nobody looks forward to leftover right. night, right? This year, it may be harder to have an open house, though, where you get rid of all these leftovers, right? Because right? of COVID. So I'm trying to think of some things you could do here. The obvious thing would be just don't make as much food. But, yeah, but where's the fun in that? I know, but I think that's hard to do. <laughs> We're so used to making certain recipes and we make them the same way. And yeah. so we still end up with a large amount. You know, and you could eat them for a few days. That'll get kind of boring after a while. Right. So I guess you could freeze them and you'd have some dinner for another night. Um, Another thought, since we were talking about St. Stephen and giving away to the poor, being charitable, if you know of anybody in your neighborhood that could use a little extra help or a meal, you could, you know... Box that up or put it in containers and take it to them. Right. Or if you have people that live nearby and you're like, hey, we have extra turkey. What did you guys make for your holiday? And they have some. You could swap, you know, something really easy peasy like that. Okay. So our last holiday is one that we all celebrate all over the world. We all have our own ways of doing it, but Mm -hmm. we all make sure it's going to happen. And that is New Year's Eve. I can imagine that this year, even though our (laughs) celebrations are going to be smaller and maybe quieter, Mm -hmm. they might be the most festive because it seems like all of us are ready to kick 2020 to the curb. Oh my gosh, right? Truer words have never been spoken. So... What do you usually do for New Year's Eve? Um, depends on the year, and it depends on if we can get a sitter for our children. <laughs> ah, yes, I hear that's difficult. Yeah, I mean, they're getting older, so we could probably get away with maybe going out for a few hours. But in the past, we've gotten together with some really good friends of ours that have kids around the same age. Mm-hmm. So we might all like hang out at somebody's house and play games, and we usually each make something. And then at midnight, we do the toasting, right? We watch the ball sure. drop and do champagne kids get you know the sparkling cider stuff yeah right sometimes if we get the sitter my husband and I'll go out for like a really nice dinner okay and usually New Year's Eve is like that meal I don't worry about it yeah I eat whatever I'm like it does happen it's last, everybody it's the last day of the year <laughs> that's Heather when does I, throw <laughs> caution to the wind that's, that's when I'm not a dietitian <laughs> Woo, yeah That's when she's like, I'm a flight attendant when anybody asks. (laughs) So how about you, Bethany? Well, our New Year's celebrations have quieted down a little bit. Like in recent years, we used to kind of go out to our neighbors and, you know, play Mm -hmm. games, played a lot of cards against humanity. 
But now we just kind of, we get dressed up and we go out for a nice dinner. The last several years we've been going out for fondue. We have a really nice fondue restaurant around here. Mm -hmm. And we do it because number one, it's, you know, it's a little more expensive. So it's not something you do regularly. Yeah. And secondly, it's an event. You know, it's not just going and ordering food and eating food. It's a four course thing and they have champagne for you on New Year's Eve and little like noisemakers and stuff. And you have to do your cheese course and then you do your salad course. So you, it takes a couple of hours to yeah. do, which is kind of nice. And then we come home and we put on our sweats because we're all full of cheese and chocolate <laughs> and we'll watch a movie or we'll, you know, binge a TV show. A couple of years ago, we were in the middle of watching Downton Abbey like yeah. right around New Year's so we watched a bunch of that and then we turn on the TV at midnight and have our toast and count down with our dog and yeah. you know it's just <laughs> yeah we're kind of like pathetically like old people that way <laughs> like we just you know we it's like staying out all night anymore <laughs> right those days are those days are long gone I want to be in my jammies and in bed by 12 30 right, you know? right yeah I'm thinking this year will be different for us too for New Year's Eve we'll probably just hang out at home and yeah play games with the kids and maybe watch a movie or something too I don't know if we aren't able to see friends or go out to parties we know there will always be food though Totally. And because the U.S. is home to so many people of different cultures and traditions, many of these special foods that are eaten for the new year have found their way here. Hmm. So I'll start with one that I grew up with, and that is pickled herring. Mm. And I slightly <laughs> gag when I say it out loud. Um, my great grandma and great grandpa were from Poland, and they brought this particular tradition with them. Herring is abundant in Poland and in parts of Scandinavia. And because of their silver coloring, many people in these countries eat pickled herring at midnight to bring a year of bounty and prosperity. And some hmm. eat it in cream sauce and some eat it with onions. Yum. Neither which sound particularly delicious. <laughs> so if you grew up with this tradition, have you tried it? Judging by the look on my face, you pro probably would have said, yes, I actually have. I did it once, and once was more than enough. And I just have to say, I, it did not bring me a particularly prosperous year. Aww. So I figured wah, that, wah. yeah, right? I figured that was one that I could just be like, okay, I did it. It doesn't work. I don't need to do it ever again. <laughs> I've heard about the tradition in Japan of eating buckwheat soba noodles at midnight to bid farewell to the year gone by and welcome the new one. The long noodles symbolize longevity and prosperity. See, now that's one I could get behind. Okay, well, you yeah. can do that this year, Bethany. Right? Noodles are so good. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can't really go wrong with noodles. But you know what else is also really tasty are tamales. Oh, yeah. And that's a traditional Mexican food to eat for special occasions like New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. So we have a family friend who grew up in uh, New Mexico, and his family makes tamales for Christmas. So I've had like the real, like somebody has actually mm -hmm. prepared them from scratch, and yeah. they are delicious. If you've never had them, it's a like a soft corn dough that's stuffed with meat and cheese and then there's spices and things in there and you wrap it in a corn husk or I guess a banana leaf sometimes mm -hmm. they use and then you bake it yeah. and oh they're just so good. They are. Mm. <laughs> what about stew? Stew would be good. Yeah. Italians make a traditional sausage and lentil stew called cotechino con lenticchi. Ooh. Yes. Listen that, to your Italian. Yeah, and it's said to bring good luck. Uh, well, that's what most people eat stuff for. If you're going <laughs> to eat something strange on New Year's Eve, it's supposed to bring good luck. So I get an easy one to pronounce. Hailing from the southern U.S. states, there's Hoppin' John. Mm -hmm. And that's pork-flavored peas or black-eyed peas and rice that are thought to bring, again, good luck and wealth in the new year. Mm -hmm. And given that they are, quote, pork-flavored... I'm guessing that bacon grease is an ingredient in these. <laughs> Just might be. There are healthier versions of Hop and John, which we will include in our show notes. Mm -hmm. But what's important to remember here is that these foods are traditional holiday foods. So if we are looking at them as special items, we know that we should have them in moderation. Right. Now, Bethany, is there a traditional holiday food you just cannot do without? <sighs> 
okay, that's a good Knowing question. you, there's got to be something. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing me, right? Well, I would have to say our traditions have changed so much over the years that it's very hard to find something that we still make every year. But one of the things that I remember that I love, and if I do have occasion to make it, I do. It, these are my aunt's mashed potatoes, and they're like occasion mashed potatoes. Okay. These are not like just throw some butter and milk in there. Mm-hmm. They have sour cream and cream cheese and they're whipped and like you bake them and whip them and then bake them again. Like Oh my. Yeah. And when you take it out of the oven it weighs like a hundred pounds, it feels like. <laughs> and they're so decadent. They're almost like dessert potatoes, if you huh. can imagine. Okay. So I love those. And then my husband's family, when we do Christmas with them, they they always have brandy slush. Mm, and I don't you're talking. Right? Yeah. I don't know if brandy slush is a thing beyond like I don't know if it's a Wisconsin thing or if it's a all over the place thing. Yeah, but we're it's big bas- on brandy here. We so. love our brandy. Yeah. And it's it's basically just brandy and orange juice, I think, just mixed together. And then you freeze it and it gets slushy and yeah. then you scoop it into a mug and you put a little bit of ginger ale or you put a little bit of seven up in there. Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh, I could like I could have five, six. If Uh-oh. That's I don't not moderation, Bethany. I know I don't, but I could. <laughs> what about you, Heather? Yeah, I don't have a ton of traditional foods that I eat, but I do usually make a green beans dish. Okay, it has like toasted almonds on mm. it, just a little bit of prosciutto. Ooh, yes, so fancy. It's fan- like we don't normally eat that, so okay. but we'll have it then, and then. This I don't always make. It's if I have time and we're not traveling, but I love molasses cookies. Oh, I it's do It's my too. favorite cookie <gasps> in the world. And yeah, they're like the chewy kind. and Just like my grandma used oh, to make. Yeah, they're so good. But I don't always make them every year either because... I just love them so much, and I want to eat them all. So I usually we have it. found the food. Yeah. We have found the food that calls Heather in the yes. middle of the night. It even calls to me from the freezer in the basement. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, they must be good. Yeah, they are. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. Whatever holidays you celebrate this year, be sure to do safely and to remember that moderation and maybe even swapping some ingredients can be the key to keeping your dinners on the heart-healthy side. Happy holidays to all of you, and as we always say, be Be the the ruler ruler of of your your own heart. heart. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the Queen of Hearts podcast. Our podcast is recorded here at the Karen Yance Women's Cardiac Awareness Center inside Aurora St. Luke's Medical Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. For more heart-healthy tips, info, recipes, and more, visit our website at www.karenyancecenter.org, like us on Facebook at Karen Yance Center, and follow us on Pinterest. If you like what you hear, subscribe to our show and be sure to tell us. Until next time, be ruler of your own heart.